House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are gathering here this morning to um, to continue our work on S-124, an act relating to miscellaneous law enforcement. Um, I understand that Commissioner Sherling has a tight time schedule this morning, and um, so we will jump right in and invite him to share some thoughts with us. Um, how long do we have with you, Commissioner? Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. The committee assistants have arranged for me to be with you for 20 minutes and then go to another committee at 1050. All right, and then we can invite you back on a future day if we feel like we need more information from you. Sure. Great. So what would you like to share with us uh, regarding S-124? Uh, I believe in the correspondence that it indicated you wanted to discuss dispatch fees. Um, I didn't have any other framing in advance. I think uh, there's only two uh, things to flag for you. Uh, one is a timeline that directs the Criminal Justice Training Council and Director to provide a, uh, a report back to the legislature by the 1st of January. Uh, and I would just flag for you that uh, the, we're in the final phases of hiring a new director. That person uh, likely will not be on board and in uh, and available working until uh, I would guess October at this point. So that that time it may make sense to move that timeline back just a bit. Uh, and the other flag is Section 10A. There's a number of uh, uh, directions given to various entities uh, to report back on some things. Um, it may take a little bit longer to unpack that with you, but the, as you know, the governor issued an executive order now uh, 10 plus days ago, uh, and we're actively working uh, to execute the directions there. And there's uh, quite a bit of overlap uh, between the two. So I think without getting into the granularity, um, what may make sense is for uh, us to uh, report to the General Assembly on the work that's executed as a result of the executive order. And then in uh, assuming you're not still in session in, in October, uh, in, um, in January, uh, revisit those sections to see if there's additional work that you'd like done or additional direction. Okay. And then relative to dispatch fees, I can walk you, I, I, it's been several months since I walked you through this uh, piece of the proposal in our modernization strategy. So I can do as much or as little uh, of that as you'd like. 124 only get, is, is re-memorializing statutory authority and actually being a little bit more uh, prescriptive that we shall adopt a fee structure. Right now we have the authority to adopt a fee structure. So. Uh, and as you know, our plan is to adopt a fee structure. So uh, no real comments relative to that other than to observe that it's more prescriptive than the existing statute, but that's fine under the circumstances from our perspective. Questions from committee members regarding dispatch. This has been a, a hot topic in committee for a few days. John Gannon. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner Sherling, for testifying. Um, so it, it, it's my understanding that um, the Department of Public Safety is planning to go ahead with starting to charge dispatch fees in FY22. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, I would flag, however, that uh, the, the plan is to begin charging at a fractional rate. So. Uh, we've come up with a construct we think is the most simplistic and appropriate construct for establishing the bills. And just to walk you through that very briefly, that's just to take the cost of dispatchers themselves, no overhead, no administrative costs, no inflated costs, just the people who do the dispatching themselves and divide that equally over the call volume and come up with a, a, a cost per call and then uh, use that as the basis for what agencies pay. Uh, and to then phase that in over what would eventually what would essentially be a five year process. So in fiscal 21, there'd be no bill. In fiscal 22, they would receive a bill for 25% of the total uh, and then increasing in 25% increments over the course of four years for a five year implementation. 
And, and th that is inconsistent with the current language in S-124, which I think requires rulemaking and then a three-year delay um, before any dispatch fees are charged. Uh, that may be a, a new portion. I, I only got 124, I think, yesterday, and I had five different committees. So I may have missed that piece of, uh, of the puzzle. So I think uh, under 124, these dispatch fees would not be start being charged until FY24 at the earliest. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure we have strong feelings uh, one way or another. Again, this is just an effort at uh, balancing the scales um, for agencies and in particular for taxpayers. There are taxpayers out there who are paying for dispatching services uh, twice uh, in uh, some kind of a PSAP or a dispatch facility that covers their town. And then they're also subsidizing other towns that are not uh, paying for services. So the timeline for that, I think, is less important than the, than the policy shift. Well, you understand that the municipalities that will be impacted by this dispatch fees will have their property taxes likely increase because of this, um, which impacts taxpayers as well. Um, we are uh, we are aware that there's a variety of different potential funding methodologies, and that could be one. Um, but again, it, it, right now we have a system where there is a cross section of agencies that don't pay for services, and there's a, an equally large, if not larger, cross section of agencies that do. And it just from a fundamental uh, delivery of government perspective, uh, the construct does not make operational sense. So all we're trying to do is fix that. This is not a money maker. We have not incorporated uh, inflows into our budget in any way. Um, and also important to note that this is part of a larger suite of, uh, of modernization initiatives, m the majority of which, with the exception of this one, are looking to reduce costs to municipalities for information technology, for the IT infrastructure that's required to connect to the state, um, for training, uh, and for uh, mental health response, which is a, a whole other topic that has been um, taken up at, at length uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks. So um, overall, we're looking to reduce the burden on communities. This is just happens to be one piece where uh, in that uh, balancing of uh, cost and, and operations that um, we're pretty confident that this makes uh, operational sense. Well, some of the testimony we heard indicated that local law enforcement may have to actually decrease their the number of law enforcement officers they have in order to pay for this service. Um, we have heard uh, just, I think, from one chief who indicated that in the various meetings uh, and in feedback from emails, uh, that has not been a widespread uh, concern. Um, So that's, that's all I can say on that topic. Okay, thank you. Jim Harrison. Morning, thank you. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, for joining us this morning. Um, we all realize that uh, dispatch is an important function and we need to have that service and collectively we need to pay for it. Um, I'm wondering if you've looked at the efficiency side of providing dispatch. And by that, I mean, um, have you considered uh, whether your agency should just do all dispatch? Um, conceivably could be more efficient. I'm not saying it would necessarily be better. Um, and that would be a good conversation to have, but I'm wondering if you considered um, just doing all of the dispatch which would hopefully free up a lot of money that some towns and cities are paying today? That's a, a great question, sir. Um, we have contemplated that if you, if one of the bases for the modernization strategy we put forth is 50 years of studies that have been done. They all say the same thing, that combining services, regionalizing services, centralizing services, instead of fragmenting them and doing them repetitively over and over again, in public safety broadly, not just in law enforcement or dispatch, but for a lot of the services that we deliver, 
Um, that has been talked about literally since the year before I was born. And all of the reports and studies say the same thing. They all come to the same conclusion that not replicating things on a small scale makes sense. Um, that said, um, there are many law enforcement and public safety entities, uh, ambulance services, uh, fire departments, et cetera, that are very happy with uh, either having their own uh, dispatch facility or um, sharing with others. There are other regional public safety answering points, at least four uh, fairly large ones that operate in the state that do an excellent job and their construct is actually less expensive uh, than state government. I, it, that is not a surprise that um, operating in the state construct for a host of different reasons um, actually inflates cost. So we didn't come forward with a plan that, that was to uh, absorb other dispatch entities. And we've actually communicated to uh, the 100 plus agencies that we dispatch for. We're, uh, we're trying to be as pragmatic as possible. If you believe you can get the services, the equal services or better services at a lower cost, um, by all means, uh, explore the other PSAPs, explore your own um, shared services. Uh, again, this is not an effort to try to make money or to co-opt work from others. Um, it's just a very complicated landscape with a lot of different variables. And, and as I described, it's uh, one of the things I, I actually neglected to describe was we have agencies call us with some frequency saying, we'd like you to dispatch for us and we can't take them on because we would have to come to you for an increase in budget and our budget's not stable as it is at this stage. We, we, as you heard me testify very early in the session, I'll just refresh this. We, we put forth a three-year budget stabilization plan just to get us to a point of equilibrium where we weren't asking for um, residual funds um, at the end of each fiscal year just to balance the budget. So we're unable, at, 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 on the one hand, we're providing free services to some agencies. Whole host of other agencies are not paying. Some of them wanna come to us to get their services. We don't have the ability to do that. It's just a very unstable, uneven and, and, and unfair system that's been created. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. I, I can appreciate that. Um, However, as we all know, changing um, the current system is not easy. And sometimes different agencies work in their own individual silo. Um, when A&R and transportation came up with a, you know, the better roads, clean water provisions, um, those provisions impacted small rural towns that had just as many roads going through them, but not the population to support them. So we, we have a tendency sometimes to, um, well, it's, it's only fair that everybody takes care of their own roads, um, but then we forget that the town only has 800 people um, and just as many roads to repair and fix of a town that's got 8,000 people. So um, I'm not sure there's an easy, answer for this. I appreciate what you're doing. I just, whatever we do, I want to have it done as efficiently and as well as we can. And I'm not sure duplicating um, the same service over and over makes the most sense, but I may be, um, may be wrong on that. So thank you. Well, I, I think you're right, sir. The, the studies on this go back again 50 years and they all do say exactly what you're saying, which is to the greatest extent possible, reduce the duplication of effort. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but you're, sure. you are right on point. Okay, thank you. Bob Hooper. Uh, hey, Mike slash commissioner. Um, Sir? You, you said something uh, a little bit ago and it, you're the guy the buck stops with, so we'll talk about bucks, uh, that you did not include these fees in the budget, but the fees that are collected go into a special fund. The special fund is able to be used for department expenses to some degree. If you're not including it in the budget, the budget is staying effectively neutral. Where's the money going to go? And how can you do this off budget if you're effectively taking in a fee that should offset something in your budget? 
No, I, it, that's a great question. So to, uh, for allow, thank you for allowing me to clarify that. What, what I'm saying is we're not looking down the road and trying to build our budget around these fees. We will absolutely have to account for them and they will uh, by default create an, an offset to help operating costs, but that's not the goal um, at all. We're, we're not, re in other words, we're not relying on uh, a projected income here in order to balance our budget in the future. If the income comes, that will be uh, a, a benefit to the state's budget. But if all 100 plus agencies leave us and get their dispatch services elsewhere, then that's fine as well. We're, we're, we're not relying on this as a way to balance the budget in the future. May I follow up, Madam Chair? Um, how much of the outsourced dispatching is workload that is attributable to the number of FTEs dispatch has? Roughly 50% of the total workload um, for our dispatchers is with these 100 agencies. Thank you. All right, committee members, any other questions before Commissioner Sherling takes off to another Zoom room? Great. Well, Commissioner, you get three bonus minutes to uh, get Figure up and walk around for your next meeting. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to come back if it is uh, helpful to the committee. Just let me know. Uh, we may want to uh, have another conversation with you next week. Um, so we'll we'll be in touch to try to schedule that. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move the schedule around a little bit because um, we have with us uh, Sheriff Mark Anderson right now, and I understand that his schedule is a little touch and go here and there. And um, so since he's here right now, um, uh, Sheriff Anderson, could you uh, could you share with us um, uh, any thoughts that you have either sparked by this conversation or um, or in response to other sections of S124? Uh, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. I'm not used to calling into Zoom by phone. Uh, the, uh, I have a, several thoughts uh, and also some comments based on previous conversations on behalf of the Sheriff's Association. Uh, generally, for the Sheriff's Association, we support a vast majority of this bill. Uh, Regarding dispatching, uh, we have for years said uh, that we have concerns about the duplication of services and the double taxation on Vermonters. Uh, that is by way of uh, a variety of, of things, and I don't need to, to get into all of that unless uh, specific questions are, are requested. However, with regards to dispatching, uh, we firmly believe that regionalized uh, services would be uh, more valuable to Vermonters. That's not just for law enforcement dispatching, but that also embodies fire and EMS dispatching as well. Uh, there are several sheriffs around the state who are currently prepared uh, and capable of providing dispatch services. Uh, speaking from my agency alone uh, and looking at the various town budgets uh, with regards to uh, concerns about increased taxation, uh, I think that some of the fees that uh, if the Department of Public Safety's bill were to, or a proposal were to be followed to a T, um, that towns could uh, ultimately move services to uh, a regionalized dispatch center, whether that's operated by a uh, municipality or sheriff. Uh, it could also uh, reasonably um, improve services for uh, the citizens of uh, each region. And I'm using the word region specifically uh, because I think that there's uh, valuable uh, delineations that uh, some communities have uh, where in Wyndham County, I might have a town that feels are better served in in Bennington or Windsor County and vice versa for towns and, and neighboring counties uh, to mine. So the, uh, I, for a cost savings aspect, I think that we're actually going to be uh, better served uh, in regionalizing it. I would also uh, think that a permissive, not a requirement, but a permissive to allow counties to fund sheriffs for dispatch operations could allow for uh, resolution to issues such as the 800 person town for which I have several of those. Um, where they have the same cost of the roads, but ultimately uh, within each county, we generally have a uh, the the political 
or I don't, I don't want to say political, but more the, the identity of each county, which differs from different portions of the state, but are rather uh, similar when we speak about the, the region itself. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, committee members, uh, questions for Mark Anderson on dispatch. All right. Um, have you had the opportunity to review um, some of the other components of S-124? Uh, I, I will admit uh, the last time I read it before this morning was uh, during the last session. So I'm rusty in several areas. I received notice of this uh, hearing uh, not long ago. So I'm working on, I'm at page 16 thus far. <laughs> I can understand that you uh, that you wouldn't have had much time to review it, and and so I wonder if we uh, I wonder if we might have um, the hope of of getting you back in with us sometime next week. Uh, I'd be happy to try as best as I can. Um, I my schedule uh, for the next three weeks or so is uh, very volatile uh, with short or no notice uh, uh, demands. All right, so committee members, do you have any sections of the bill that you would like to focus uh, the sheriff's attention to um, so that he can prep for coming back to hopefully to speak with us um, uh, at a future meeting? Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize if this question was answered. I'm still trying to figure out my iPad here. Um, Sheriff, who do you get your dispatch services through currently? I currently provide them for myself, sir. Okay, so you're one of those private peace apps. Is that like like Lamoille? So uh, a delineation in terminology, uh, a peace app or a public safety answering point receives 911 calls. My office is not the direct uh, call taking agency that receives 911 calls. So uh, this is a, a problem with uh, duplicity and uh, fracturing of dispatching uh, in the state as it currently stands and has stood for for decades uh, where a 911 call comes into the PSAP and then the PSAP looks up the emergency uh, agency that's supposed to respond and then they uh, call them and if more than one piece or I'm sorry more than one emergency response is required such as police and fire or fire and EMS or police fire and EMS all three of those agencies need to be contacted and so what I'm saying is let's condense it all into one answering point where the PSAP and the, the police and the fire and the EMS all have dispatchers in the same room. Uh, the, uh, I operate a dispatch uh, that serves my, uh, my office, uh, another county sheriff, uh, a police department, and I feel like we answer for one other entity. I can't think of it right now. Uh, we operate 24 hours uh, and uh, we have the ability and the capacity to expand. It's all contract based though, which means that each year we have to uh, evaluate the contract and what works and what doesn't work. And if unique costs such as COVID-19 come up, what effects that has. Uh, turns out that uh, it was incredibly, COVID was incredibly detrimental to uh, my dispatching operation, which actually threatened its ability to operate. But we are able to, uh, through Act 147, uh, provide the, the guaranteed support uh, to continue operating an emergency dispatch operation. Sure. So what, what kind of infrastructure upgrades would have to happen on your end to become a PSAP? Uh, regarding the PSAP, I think I would need to talk with the 911 board to, uh, to fully understand their requirements. Uh, so I don't want to comment to that right this moment. Uh, however, in terms of the capacity, uh, both technical and personnel uh, to be able to, if I wanted to provide dispatching uh, to all the agencies in my county, I think I need to set up three repeater sites uh, and uh, connect to the computer systems that we use. It's all, uh, the cost of radio infrastructure uh, is probably more significant. I'm fortunate that I have a pretty strong uh, uh, options available in my county. Uh, speaking with some of the other sheriffs, uh, they also have, uh, uh, positive uh, relationships and or access to uh, sites and facilities that would allow them to expand if the funding were there. Very good. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, any other questions from committee members? Mike Berwicki. Well, I just want to thank the sheriff. I'm not sure if everyone's aware he's currently on National Guard duty right now. So he's taking some time from that to, to do some work here. So I, I appreciate that uh, he's, he's gone out of his way to help us out here. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, just as a, a note of reference, uh, I am not here uh, in my capacity with the National Guard. I am here as the representative of the Wyndham County Sheriff's Office and the Vermont Sheriff's Association. I was told I need to say that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for clarifying that. Great. Um, committee, any other questions uh, for Mark Anderson? All right, so we will be in touch to see if we can give you um, a little more time to review different parts of the bill and uh, and see if we can find you next week. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can I just make some uh, some other comments on the areas I am aware of and absolutely uh, might be able to uh, speed over uh, the council membership uh, we spoke favorably of. There's several people who are overlooked uh, who I believe are added uh, based on this. So I think that is positive. Uh, I uh, agree with the commissioner's assessment on the report uh, that the executive director needs to make as part of the, the process in helping uh, identify uh, candidates for the executive director. They're gonna have a lot to do. Um, so some easing on that would be uh, very useful for the, the incoming director uh, once they're, uh, they're hired. Uh, the, uh, I think uh, Chief Brickell from the, uh, the chair of the training council is also on the call who might be able to speak to some more of the, the minutia of the council related bills, but ultimately there's not a lot that the council disagrees with. Uh, the concern on body cameras, uh, I am an agency that has body cameras. I have uh, awareness of the costs, the, uh, the technical issues, the training issues that go with it. Uh, my biggest concern with body cameras, uh, aside from the acquisition costs and the storage costs is the public records uh, burden. The, uh, it has become extremely uh, pro uh, prohibitive uh, in my agency uh, when a person wants to review the body camera footage uh, for a, uh, an event. Uh, and these are not the events we're seeing on national TV today. These are events surrounding maybe uh, a response to a person in a mental health crisis, which brings in two, three, four officers uh, who have different involvements, different levels, and it requires uh, a one-to-one -one time ratio of a person processing uh, the video to ensure that we're meeting confidentiality requirements, that we're not releasing information that is uh, exempt under the public records laws. And then it comes to the, the point where we need the technical ability to be able to process through the redaction or the uh, blurring or, or other activities required to uh, appropriately sanitize uh, things. The, uh, the inherent nature is that a one hour incident with four officers requires more than four hours of administrative time to process it. I have concerns about the, uh, or the Sheriff's Association has concerns about the, uh, the public uh, nature of what is otherwise very private. If I activate my body camera uh, and enter into someone's uh, home, uh, there might be things in their home that, while not illegal, uh, might be embarrassing to them, uh, and that could potentially become public record uh, for other things. Uh, and then there's also concerns about who would be and would not be required, similar to uh, what the uh, state police spoke about uh, regarding uh, the colonel being required to wear a body camera where he's not performing law enforcement functions, he's uh, administering the agency. So just the, the minutia of the body cameras uh, does bring uh, concern to me. Uh, and I fear uh, if not appropriately or, or deeply examined uh, in the minutia, we will uh, have a lot of issues uh, that will uh, increase cost to Vermonters. Yes, definitely um, that is uh, that is a concern that we have heard uh, many times in committee and we, we share that. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, committee, any other questions on body cam for Mark Anderson? And was there anything else that you wanted to share with us about your review of the bill so far? 
Uh, up to page 16, no, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Thank you so much for doing uh, double time, double duty here in uh, scrambling to make yourself available. And uh, we'll see if we can um, come back to you next week. Great, and if I'm not able to attend, I would be happy to submit in writing uh, any answers to questions. Uh, that might be an, an easier way, uh, should it be necessary, but I will do my best to attend in person. That would be great, thank you. We'll, we'll be in touch by email. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome to stay and listen to as much of this as you're able to, and um, we're gonna switch gears now and uh, go to a different witness. And it seems to be um, seems to be well represented by folks in the Wyndham County area. So um, Ann Schroeder is with us this morning, um, and it, it appears by our agenda that you are on the Criminal Justice Committee of the NCAA, uh, NAACP of Wyndham County. And um, I would love to uh, welcome you to share your thoughts um, with us on S-124. Um, thank you um, to the committee um, and to the chairperson for the opportunity to testify on S-124. And um, as Sarah said, I'm a member of the Com Criminal Justice Committee of Wyndham County um, NAACP, and I'm a resident of Dummerston. Um, and um, I have a few specific comments on um, um, S-124, and I did um, send to Andrea the text of this. So um, if you, you'll, I guess those are posted on your committee page. I, I'm not so sure about this. Um, but one of them is on section 124, uh, uh, S-124 section 10A, um, where it says about military equipment. And it says, after an opportunity for community involvement and feedback, the law enforcement advisory board shall recommend a statewide policy on law enforcement officers use of military equipment. Now, um, I wondered if this could be improved to be something like New York S08508. And what they say there is prohibits state or local police from accepting military surplus equipment from the federal government. Um, so in all of this is, will be in the notes if anybody wants to look more at that. Um, following that one, um, since the board is already studying the military equipment, I wonder if they could study something like invasive surveillance technologies. And, um, and I would suggest putting this in as something like number eight um, saying after an opportunity for community involvement and feedback, the law enforcement advisory board shall recommend a statewide policy on law enforcement officers use of surveillance technologies, advanced or autonomous weaponry, facial recognition software, and predictive uh, policing policies. And the last part of the technology part there you may recognize from the ACLU NAACP 10 point plan that was recently issued. Um, I don't know how many of these technologies are currently being used in Vermont, um, but I think it would be good to get ahead of this. Um, and one issue, for example, is that facial recognition software has been proven in multiple studies to be inaccurate at identifying people of color and especially black women. Um, and here's an example, again, this is from um, Mass 2800 section 65C, and they say there shall be a co special commission to study the use of facial recognition by the Department of Transportation and law enforcement agencies. Um, also, also um, on January 14th of 20, um, in step with Somerville and Brookline, Cambridge has banned the use of facial surveillance technology. And 72320, the New York legislature has passed a two year moratorium on the use of facial recognition in schools. Um, in another section, um, 906, emergency medical training, um, would it be possible to add um, some kind of diversity training um, to uh, perhaps after number one, which is about the minimum standards for training emergency medical personnel? basic life support, all of these are, are good. Um, but I recently read of a woman of color who had a blood clot and she tried to get help in an emergency room and they kicked her out 
and they called the police and she ended up dying in the police car. So I, I think this would, might be another place where more diversity training for the, for the EMTs would be a good thing. Um, some other things that I would like added, um, and all of these are mentioned in the ACLU NAACP 10 point plan, um, uh, ending qualified immunity. And on 61920, the governor of Colorado signed SB 217 into law and end ending qualified immunity, um, removing police from schools. On 7720, the DC council moved to remove police from city schools uh, by voting eight to five to disapprove of the city's school security contract. Um, another one also from the plan is limiting police involvement in low level offenses um, on six, five and 20, San Marcos, Texas, low level offenses in San Marcos are now being punished with a citation instead of an arrest. Um, and, and San Marcos is the first city in Texas to implement a site and release ordinance, making it a law for officers to issue citations for certain crimes. The statute will limit San Marcos police from arresting for misdemeanors like possession of small amounts of marijuana or driving with an invalid license. Um, and here's a question about section nine, um, law enforcement agency duty to disclose. Um, and right now um, uh, the requirement is, is that the officers that, okay. The, or the requirement of a current law enforcement agency disclose its analysis of its law enforcement officers performance at the agency as set forth in 20 VSA section 2362A in section eight of this act shall not apply if there is a binding non-disclosure agreement prohibiting that disclosure that was executed prior to the effective date of that sector. So while we have a moment, um, Mike and Hal, are you all ready to roll with your, uh, with your informational session and floor report? I think we are. And uh, it should take about 15 minutes What do you think, Mike? I, I think the, the four of us, <laughs> or the four tops, are, are ready to go. Do you have a little four-part harmony going on there? Or? <laughs> We're working on that. Working on it. <laughs> Great. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we discussed this briefly at our caucus, and the massage therapist in the pharmacy just had tons of questions that we just weren't able to answer and we encouraged them to ask them on the floor. That would be appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and expect it. <laughs> so uh, Rob, would, would you wanna be part of the team answering those questions on massage? <laughs> Actually, I was part of the team to come up I, with the questions. I thought so. <laughs> oh, I bet you were. <laughs> No, I think it's going to be extremely smooth sailing. Great. I mean, you're surrounded by a very talented and hardworking committee that just makes everybody that presents look and, good, don't we? And humble. <laughs> so, especially with Harrison. <laughs> Harrison inspires humility. Yeah, so... Hi, um, Anne. Are you back with us? I'm very sorry. We are... Our, our area has just... Um, switch to um, Comcast and everybody is complaining and they just ducked out and I'm very sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't even reach you by phone. Everything just, but it's back. Um, and um, thank you for your patience. Um, I, I'll, these other two, these are very quick. If, if I still have time to read these other ones. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so these are some things to think about for later bills on police reform. And I do wanna say one thing I was very pleased about with this bill was the addition of, it, of, of other people to the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, I've been to some of those meetings and it, it was, it, it's really nice to see more, it will be nice to see more diversity there of, of different people in different roles. Um, but these are some other uh, ideas about boards and um, the law en enforcement board, uh, law enforcement advisory board that's mentioned in those two earlier sections of 
10 a uh, um, 10 a7 and and might possibly constituted more like Massachusetts suggested independent and they they call, they call it an independent police officers standards and accreditation committee um, and mass s2800 section 221 is proposing an independent police officer standards and accredit accreditation committee within the executive office of public safety and security consisting of 13 members including a two from the aclu i mean i mean one from the aclu two from two different naacp branches um, a representative from the black and latina caucus um, and a bunch of other people um, and this this board, I would really like the other uh, the law enforcement advisory board, um, you know, and I do understand we need law enforcement people on there, but I think it's a time now to be putting some other people on there. Um, also, the, the council advisory committee that was mentioned in 10 a number five about access to complaint information is too small. Um, there's four people, and according to the website, the terms of the of the members have all expired, which I'm sure hasn't really happened. But the website says that. Um, and again, I would like to see that committee um, constituted more like the Massachusetts one. Um, another section of S124, um, 10A4, says that different agencies and interested parties will consult to identify a central point for reporting allegations of law enforcement officer misconduct, which may be the council or another entity and how those allegations should be handled. Again, I would like this central point to be something like the independent police officer standards and accreditation committee proposed by Massachusetts. Um, and, and what that, they say, um, this com committee shall have the power to receive complaints of officer misconduct from any person request an officer's appointing authority to conduct an investigation of a complaint of officer misconduct and conduct independent investigations and adjudications of complaints of officer misconduct. Um, and the last one, um, um, in 10A, section 10A of S124, um, models of civil civilian oversight. And this has the officer, Office of Attorney General consulting with the council, um, HRC, the League of Cities and Towns, and other interested parties um, to recommend um, one or more models of civilian oversight. And um, here again, um, something like the, what Massachusetts is proposing would give voting rights to social justice organizations rather than just consulting with them. Um, and thank you very much for, for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for scrambling to get back in touch with us after your technical glitch. Um, committee members, does anyone have a question for Ann Schroeder? Mike Merwicki, go ahead. Hi, hi, Ann. I want to thank you for taking the yes. time. Hi, Mike. And uh, and also, I, I believe you're speaking on behalf of the Wyndham County NAACP. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Right. And this these these are suggestions that were. Uh, brought together collectively by, by the people working with the group? Yes, well, the committee um, is, is composed of myself and Linda Bowl and, and Nader Hasim is, is our chairperson. And I did check in with our president um, um, before I, before I um, you know, decided to do, and he, he was the one who suggested that I testify because I'm sure you've seen Stefan Gillum um, before, probably at your committee or other committees. And he suggested that I testify. So they, they've looked at this. Well, uh, thank you for taking the time. And, and I'm sorry, the, the internet continues to be a problem. We, we're working on it, but it, you know, uh, that's a longer story. Yeah, well, I hope you don't have Comcast also where you are because we had to switch from Southern Vermont cable and it, it, it's just been really bad. <laughs> Well, thank you for taking the time today. Thank you, thank you, Mike, and for being my rep. <laughs> uh, John Gannon. Thank you, and thank you, Anne, for testifying today. Um, with respect to, to one of the things you testified about military equipment, um, I, 
You know, most of the military equipment coming into the state, and I have a list of everything that has come into the state from 2000 to 2019. Um, a, a lot of it is not what at least I would consider um, military weapons. I mean, some of it's trucks, forklifts, and things like that that are saving towns money. Do you have a opposition to towns purchasing surplus military trucks? Uh, no, that that I, I guess you know the you obviously know a lot more about this, Representative Gannon, than I do. Is you know I mean I assume the military equipment would be a broad spectrum, and and I think um, what I think some of this is is of course the weapons, the weaponry that we're seeing you know in the streets and other places, and I think that's the main opposition. Because I, I mean I will say the most common item purchased or, or surplus item that the, the towns and sheriff departments get are rifles. Um, but there's very few instances of what, at least I would consider outright military equipment. I mean, there is, I think one instance in um, Burlington getting a, uh, a vehicle that's, that doesn't explode over mines. So that, that seems more like a, mm -hmm. a, a something that's military grade. Um, but most of the stuff is, is just stuff that's probably a lot less expensive for towns to get for their police departments um, through the military. So I'm just worried about the overbreadth of just banning all surplus equipment. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear some of that. Of course, I, you know, as I said, I don't know how much military equipment is, is in Vermont. Um, I've just seen the pro some problems with it. And this is one of the things that was in the 10 point plan and some that other states are doing. Uh, yeah. But I, I'm appreciative to hear that, the, you know, this is not much of a problem in, in Vermont. Well, that's what I was trying to get at it is, is it a problem? Because, um, because just looking at this list, uh, I'm just not seeing, you know, you know, what I would consider um, serious military equipment coming into the state, except for a few exceptions. Um, well, that, yeah, I, and that's, and, that's good to hear. Um, the, but the, you know, the fact that it is in there in, in section 10A, um, that's why I started thinking about it and, and the, the uh, committee started thinking about it um, because it, it is gonna be studied and, and that's, that's a good thing. And, but the fact that New York is just going right out and, 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 um, and banning it, New York probably, ha I'm guessing, has a lot more problems with this. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other committee members have a question for Ann Schroeder? All right. So we can say thank you so much, Ann, oh, for uh, for joining us. I appreciate the specificity of um, of your recommendations. Uh, that's always helpful to to um, understand exactly what folks mean when they uh, when they make suggestions for uh, for the bills that are in front of us. So appreciate you taking the time. You're welcome to stick around and listen to the re remainder of the meeting. Um, next, I would like to go to the chair of the Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, Chris Brickell is with us this morning, and thank you so much for, for joining. Um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of sections of the bill that pertain to the Criminal Justice Training Council, so I wonder if you might um, give us just a, a broad introduction to the council as it's currently um, formulated, and, uh, and then share with us your thoughts on uh, S-124. Um, absolutely. And thank you for the invitation, Madam Chair. And for the record, my name is Chris Burkell. And I am the Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police representative to the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. And as you all likely know, um, currently right now, we have a an academy that's being run without an executive director and have been for a few months now. Um, we also are doing as you all are, uh, meeting by Zoom and having many more meetings than we normally are required to by statute. In fact, we've done that for probably the last two years. I mean, we're required to meet quarterly. We usually meet at least monthly now um, and have done that for some period of time. And I also um, asked Cindy Taylor-Patch just to join if she was able to today because 
I think sometimes when committee members have questions on um, a specific item or a process on how something is done at the academy, when you have the ability to talk to the person on the ground, the director of um, training that can give you how that training is actually laid out and the, and the core contents behind that, it may answer some more questions or may be more helpful for committee members. Um, so as I looked at S124, and there's quite a bit in there, and um, let me first start off by saying that I think that there are a lot of things that uh, council members all agree on, like the addition of the new membership to the council. Um, I have not heard any issues with the new membership um, other than one, uh, and I understand the differences, one um, is one addition of a law enforcement officer appointed by the VSEA. And there were some members that looked at this as just another union position being added to the council. Uh, yet I understand the other side of that in that the VSEA has a section of law enforcement, um, a small section, but a section nonetheless that are not represented on the council. And that I believe is part of the reason that that, that position and that's added to that. Um, but no, no issues um, with that at all. I think I could reiterate what the um, commissioner and both uh, Sheriff Anderson said earlier on the reporting requirements um, to be able to give the new executive director when that person is in place, the ability to really assess what is working at the academy, what training consists of, and the requirements that are going to be re, um, required of that new position to report back to both the Senate and the House on, on how things are working and what additions you would like to see done. Um, I think as far as the, the training, uh, let me broadly just say that um, there are some things that the Academy already does that I think that maybe committee members aren't real clear on. So there are, there are uh, as far as like the path from level two to level three, that is um, a topic that has been on discussion table with council members. There has been a working group um, on that, trying to figure out the best way to implement that. Um, there was actually a final product that was put together and was sent back to academy staff for them to have feedback on to see where they felt this process would work. And they had some further recommendations that were supposed to come back to the working group, but the end result was that this process wouldn't be able to take place until there was really some funding put into the Academy's budget. It would require additional people that would be looking, looking at the portfolios that were presented to them. It would require additional um, staff to test out applicants that we were looking to go from level two to level three certification. So without being able to have that additional staffing to fundamentally test people out and their practical skills and make sure that their certification level was already up to date and that their portfolio was complete is not something we can just task members with when we don't have the staff to do it. So while there is a majority of that work that's already done, um, I think that that can't really move forward without some more additional staff or funding for that to, to be able to happen. That component. Um, as far as the section that refers to no um, or a reduced um, training additional training with no overnight um, additions to it. So the Academy already um, offers training offsite. And again, this is as staff is available to do it. And this staff, I can assure you after working much more closely with them over the last few months that I have, bends over backwards at the drop of a hat to try to assist any agency that is struggling with getting somebody certified, getting their training up to date, um, getting a course offered that may not be offered at the academy during the time frame that that agency needs it. So while they do a great job and they are offering training offsite, could we be doing it a lot better? Absolutely. Could we be making training um, much simpler for someone from Newport that needs a certain uh, training to be done that they don't have to send three or four people at overtime rates and come down and have them spend overnight just because of the logistics of the academy. We absolutely can do that better. I know that academy staff works much um, with agencies that have those special needs to make that happen so that it's not a problem. But that section of um, when it says no non-overnight training, most training that's done offsite does not have an overtime component to it. 
only training that really does is the residential academy where you're there for 16 weeks. And that is really the only time other than if you are a farther distance away and want to stay closer to the academy for a multi-day training, that's the only time that overnight training is really required. So those are just some, some minor things that I think need clarification just to make sure everybody's on the same page and understand those. But um, as far as the bill, I think, would it, be, would it be wiser to go through specific sections that, that members may have questions on or uh, haven't seen movement that you want to see moving on that maybe I can answer or Cindy can answer for you? Let's go to some committee questions and see where that leads us. Uh, Jim Harrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Chief, for joining us this morning. Um, there's a section in, uh, or part of section 10A on the bill that requires a look from the council and the LEAB to look at the location of the academy. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, because you're not too far away, um, is the academy like going to need to be replaced physically? Um, you know, is it in disrepair? Um, have we not made investments there? Um, or um, should we be looking to move it elsewhere? I mean, I'm just, uh, there's no good central spot in Vermont. Um, I, I guess I would think it's, you know, better than being in Newport, um, maybe not for the people in Newport, but um, just like it's better than being in Brattleboro um, because that's not central either. So I'm curious as to, have you had any conversations about that? We have had conversations about that. And so I will give you my, my viewpoint, understanding that I am in Rutland County and I am close to the academy. But what I can tell you about that facility is does it need work? Absolutely. And there have been recent investments made in upgrading that facility. But um, I think it would be unwise to even think about moving the facility from its current location simply because of the fact that it is somewhat centrally located in the state, even though we're in the southern portion of the state. Um, there have been many upgrades made to that facility in the use of a driver's pad for um, defensive driving. We also have made a lot of upgrades to the um, range down there so that there is um, any agency can come down and use the range as long as they've just scheduled the time to do that. And many agencies do in fact do that. Um, Cindy could probably speak better to the recent upgrades in the phys physical plant in and of itself, but many agencies do come there and use that facility and it's already a state owned building and the fire academy uses that joint and anytime that there's overflow that's needed to be used for space at the academy, there's a good working relationship with the fire academy. So that classes have been also taught over at the fire academy, which has a large um, classroom space for overflow to be utilized there. So um, I don't know that there is a facility that would be better suited for police training that isn't already at Pittsford but there are other areas where potentially other um, facilities could be used such as Norwich University, such as Champlain College, where um, classroom portions of other things could be taught and made more available to other areas of the state with less impact on them trying to get to the academy for certain types of training. Okay, no, thank you. So it, it, it sounds like, um... You know, we made we we're, we're putting a lot in this bill to look at different parts of law enforcement, and I just wonder if this is something that we can talk about another day. Um, so, thank you. Go ahead, John. Actually, I think Mike was before me, so. Mike's had his hand up, but I don't think that he had a question. I think that was from before. It was? Okay. 
Um, well, thank you, Chief, for testifying. Um, yesterday, we heard testimony from Chief Pete, who's you know the newly installed um, chief for, for Montpelier, about the challenges in getting a waiver um, to come into Vermont to be a law enforcement officer. Um, is, is there anything we could do to improve that process um, and to streamline it so that we can encourage um, a more diverse um, group of law enforcement officers in the state? Uh, so in all fairness, to answer your question, um, I think that Cindy Taylor Patch would be better suited to give you the details of how that process works. But um, in short, let me brief answer saying that the process has been made to be as accommodating as it can be for that specific chief. Um, and the real drawback to his process has been the fact that your current staff and the staffing levels that we have at the academy have been totally busy trying to teach a class of brand new recruits under COVID circumstances. So that's one factor. But if, if, the, if Madam Chair, if you don't mind me deferring that answer to Cindy, I think she could be far better answering that process. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Go ahead, Cindy. Sure. Um, Drew Bloom actually oversees the waiver process, but I can speak to it. Um, we have to do an assessment of the officer's uh, training background before we can grant a waiver prescription so that we're uh, being very careful in issuing that and accepting the training from the other state. I know that uh, Drew is very quick in that part. The part that becomes, I think, probably what you heard more about is how long it takes to start your training prescription. And there are so few waiver officers that come into the state of Vermont that it's hard for us to have a robust uh, response when that happens because it, they're just so few and far between. So when we get one, uh, we work very hard to get the paperwork end of it done as soon as possible so that they can start participating in other training. Um, and one of the things that we've done to try and accommodate for that, which, um, which he did, was to attend the level two certification process so that at least some law enforcement authority can be granted uh, while they work out the other pieces of their training. So we do try to get them through that as soon as we possibly can um, so we can get them out and able to work. And then they have a, a period of months where they can work to complete the whole process that's required for a level three equivalency. So can I follow up on that? Um, so you know, if they're certified law enforcement officers in another state, um, why do they have to go through the training here in Vermont? I mean, you know, we've just yep. gone through a process in our committee um, of trying to streamline um, professionals from other states um, mm -hmm. coming into the state who, mm -hmm. who have qualifications already. Yeah, great question. And we really... Um, fine tune what they're required to do here to stuff that's Vermont specific. So we're not reteaching them how to do a traffic stop, for example, but we are teaching them about Vermont law, uh, criminal law, motor vehicle law, the specific way that we, uh, like our use of force curriculum, for example, and things like that where there are Vermont nuances where um, if they weren't made aware of them, it would be detrimental to them in trying to practice law enforcement here in the state. So, um, you know, not looking to redo any of their, their basic information, but really focus on things that are specific and nuanced to the state of Vermont. Um, you know, use of force training, for example, uh, we've certainly seen a number of officers come from other states where practices are very different than they are here in Vermont, and uh, we don't want folks um, operating outside the scope of what we expect uh, professionals in Vermont to be doing. So, um, you know, for their own sake and the sake of our communities, we want to make sure they know exactly what is trained um, and expected. And that's why we have the, the waiver training prescription process. Thank you. Great. So Chief, back to you. Do you have... Um, other observations on the bill that you'd like to share with us? Um, I, in my quick review again as well, I, I'm unfortunately under the same situation as Sheriff Anderson has been. Um, I, I looked at this um, bill several times and I don't see any real critical issues with it. I do, one of the concerns that I have um, again is around um, body cameras, and my agency is one that has had body cameras for several years as well. 
And I share the same concerns that you heard from Sheriff Anderson in the public information request, the cost for storage for me personally here, because I do not have cloud storage, I have actual hard drive storage. Um, my requirements to produce those videos um, for the prosecution and defense in any kind of case that we have going on. And then the redaction software, which um, can be very prohibitive if you don't have a subscription with a company to do that type of thing. And overall, um, the actual administration of doing that. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, I, am, I have a fairly small department, a department of seven people, um, where I am the keeper of all of that data and that uh, video information. It's my responsibility to not only review what my officers do and how they interact with the public, but then to manage all of that software to, to burn all of that video evidence and to burn any requests for the public information. I could literally have a full-time position to just deal with video, but don't have that availability. So when we start talking about policies on exactly when and where um, video will be used, when it will be turned off, when it will be turned on, who is gonna be required to wear it. Um, all of, we follow the LEAB um, policy right now and we also look at, because we are a member town of the Vermont leagues and cities of towns, they also have uh, formal policies that we can follow. Again, one with a body camera. So we look at all the best practices and do what we feel is the best um, model policy for us to follow. But if we had a standard wide policy in several things, you know, use of force, the body camera videos that would make things so much clearer for law enforcement statewide, and for the general public to be able to know what they can access, how they can access it and when they can access it without having to go to several different agencies and having different policy that they, they might have to contend with. Um, I do see in this bill an overall push to do a lot of things universally, which I fully support. And I think the training council does as well um, by not having to deal with several agencies and their different aspects of how they deal with things. It makes it easier for the training council to check on issues of certification. And um, I, I will say that um, as far as the process, and I don't know if anybody has had any questions on law enforcement certification, but for the process of um, people making complaints, all agencies in Vermont are required to accept a complaint in any format, essentially. It can be a letter, it can be anonymous, it can be by email, it can be by a phone call. And then it's that agency head's um, responsibility to determine if that's a, a credible complaint. And if so, an investigation has to be done. Once that investigation is done, within 10 days, the executive um, officer of that agency has to report to the council what those findings are. And if the findings are that it was not justified, and the council is at least made aware. But if there is a violation, and let's say it's a category B, where currently the council can only take action on a second offense, then the council is advised that there is a violation of category B. They make that annotation in their file. And then that's documented within the academy's record so that we know when a second one comes through that this is now something that the council can take action on if they choose. <clears throat> And then based upon that investigation and what factors come out in that investigation and what's determined to have happened, the council will review that and then potentially have a hearing where evidence can be offered and then a decision is made on what type of sanction that the council is allowed to take based on the statutory availability of what we can take action on. Hal Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chief, for testifying today. Um, do you have any thoughts about what uh, a model civilian oversight board could look like? There are several conversations currently going on in the state, um, some among law enforcement, um, about what is the best model for this? Are there groups that we have two groups of civilian oversight, one north and one south. Do they have one in each county that um, can look at oversight? I think we need to 
my personal opinion is that we need to move beyond what we currently have in place where um, by default, if there is not a community oversight panel, that it would default to a community's select board or a city council um, as the oversight. Because as, as hopeful as that process is, it does present certain problems in that, for instance, my select board is completely intimate with each one of my officers and myself and my processes here. And that could present conflicts in personalities or people that may not have a, um, an unbiased look that you would wanna have when you're talking about police accountability. So I do think the model of whatever that model looks like moving away from what we currently have without a real structure in place is probably a very wise option to be looking for. Um, we have in, stat in statute created the Citizens Advisory Committee that's within the council's frame that's appointed by the governor. Now that framework, that personnel has not been appointed as of yet. And I believe likely for a couple of reasons. One, because this is fairly new, but there is so much activity going on and we wanna make sure that everybody that should have a voice at the table does um, about how that process takes place and be thoughtful about it rather than trying to just establish a committee because of the fact that it says that we have that now and we're right we're rushing because of all the unrest in the world that's going on and COVID um, I think that these are very thoughtful conversations that need to be carried out um, in in length and with the proper people at the table that need to have the voices at the table thank you thank you so one question that has occurred to me um, how does the training council establish who is chair? Did you arm wrestle for it? No, I probably would have lost. Um, <laughs> that is decided upon um, each year uh, in December, the council um, has a nominating process and a vote. Um, so that process is done by council members and the current makeup of the council is of, of 12 people. So. We always kind of put it out there uh, a bit ahead of time that, hey, if people have an interest in running for a chair or a vice chair, um, we encourage that. We encourage change in that position because I don't think it's good for any one person to stay in a position for any length of time. Um, I, I have to say that this past year has been, for me, um, somewhat exciting because there is so much change going on and I'm I'm stretched a little thin right now, but at the same time, I've engaged with so many more people that I would not have um, if we weren't going through the period of time that we are now. And I'm I'm learning much more through that process. So it's um, it's making me much more aware of how critically important it is that these changes that affect the council um, affect them in a positive way, and that we have so many other people that um, not only should have but um, desperately want a seat at the council table to have some voice in how law enforcement officers are trained in the state and how we interact with the citizens that we're there to serve. All right, that was a long answer for every December. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, and thank you for your service during this really tumultuous time. I think uh, all of us can identify with um, feeling stretched a little thin, but also, appreciative of the uh, the new challenges, new skills, and new opportunities. Opportunities, best word. Jim Harrison has a question. Thank you. Um, Chief, if I could ask you to switch roles and be the chief of police in Brandon, um, rather than chair of the training council, um, criminal justice council, um, we've heard a lot about dispatch fees um, and Chief Humphreys was with us the other day and mentioned Brandon and said you have a larger department but yet your fees were proposed to be lower than his smaller department in Fairhaven and wondered if it had to do something with the type of reporting system that you both use. Do you have any insight um, on that and what the impact will be on your department for dispatch fees? Uh, I do. And 
if I can give you a little bit of the history on our town here. Um, our town used to pay dispatching fees to the Department of Public Safety for a number of years. Um, and while at the time we were paying, towns like Fairhaven, Castleton, also within my county, were paying nothing but getting the same service. It got to the point that my select board said, we're not paying anymore. Why are we paying when other agencies are not paying? Which put me, as you can imagine, in a predicament with the Department of Public Safety. Um, yet they continued to provide us our service. Now, with looking at the fee structure that has been presented, um, I, my town is being presented with a number that now is currently less than what we were paying several years ago. So the fee structure has been kind of um, all over the place over the last few years. And I don't know that I, I listened to the commissioner earlier say how he came about with their fee structure. One of the critical pieces to that, however, is though the, um, so for the agency of Fairhaven, for instance, they use the Spillman CAD system. My agency uses Valcor. They are about the only two CAD RMS systems within the state that law enforcement agencies use. I still pay to use both systems because I find some advantages to the Spillman system that are not in Valcor, but Valcor is so much user friendly makes uh, adjustments on the fly and allows me to do much more with my records management system and provide many more reports to the public more easily through my system. So having said that, when Fairhaven gets dispatched to a call, the state police dispatch them, they follow through with that officer through that call, enter the information, the complainant information, what the end result is, and then they close out that call my agency, they dispatch a call, they give it to us, and then they're done. So we do the rest of the work. We do it within our own CAD RMS system. So the I believe that the fee structure that's out there now is based on the call rate for, for that town. And I'm not sure exactly what the definition of call rate is because I don't have any control over what 911 calls come in and then are directed to me and Brandon for Brandon residents. I also don't have any control over people that don't call my police department directly, but call the local number, which rings to the state police barracks, and then they dispatch for us if someone is not in our office. So there are variable factors that create what that fee structure is for that agency. And there are a number of them that come to the conclusion of what that figure is. So I don't know what Fairhaven's figure is, but mine was um, almost half of what we were paying in the past for dispatching service. Uh, thank you, Chief. I'm probably more confused than ever, but sorry, <laughs> it's a discussion for another day. Sorry, thank you. All right, anything else? Um, anything else you'd like to share with us, Chief? Uh, I don't think so at this point, but I also um, would just like to make myself available if there are further questions or um, questions you would like responded to in writing, uh, something that comes up in other testimony that you hear that either sounds in conflict to what you heard today or doesn't make sense to you, I'd be happy to come back at any time to answer those questions for you. I appreciate that. Um, we we have a few more, more days next week to work on this bill. so. Uh, we may need to ask you to join us again. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, Cindy Taylor Patch, um, I would love to welcome you to share your thoughts. Um, I know that you have probably been uh, following some of the previous meetings and have taken a look at the bill. And uh, what, what does the committee need to know from your perspective? So um, I definitely want to give folks the opportunity to ask questions about any of the training that we do, whether whether it be basic training or in-service training. Um, as we've talked a little bit about, we do off-site um, in-service training for those who are already in the field um, at a rate of usually about uh, 20 classes or so or more a year. Obviously, COVID restrictions um, at different locations have made that really challenging this year, but just want to make sure that people do understand that we do go offsite and do training regularly for, for officers working. Um, one thing I also wanted folks to know about that I saw in the bill specifically was um, 
the piece on page 15 about the um, the council in consultation with the racial disparities panel, human rights commission, ACLU, et cetera. Uh, the piece about you know reviewing council curriculum in light of uh, fair and impartial policing lenses and things like that. We actually have that committee already um, that was developed in January. Um, we have members of the RDAP on the, on that. Um, Susanna Davis is part of the group. Uh, NAACP has a seat at the table, as well as law enforcement officers and council staff. So um, we did a, a welcome and sort of development of mission meeting in January. And then uh, when COVID happened, it certainly slowed down our work, but we have had a couple of meetings over the summer. We have another one next week. And uh, part of the work that we've done is to have our instructors take a really deep look at where they're already addressing fair and impartial policing type uh, learning objectives and um, brought that assessment back to the panel members for their, their thoughts and also have them thinking about uh, where they might do more. And it's where it fits uh, sort of organically into various different pieces of our curriculum so that the concepts are more um, interwoven rather than you're only hearing about fair and impartial policing concepts in one four hour block of training, but that the concepts are throughout. And um, so we have collected that information. Um, we have panel members sort of sitting with it now um, to give their thoughts. Um, Eitan Nazred Longo, who's part of the, the RDAP as well, and he's a co-director of fair and impartial policing for DPS, uh, is an instructor for us in that topic. Uh, and to be clear, um, that goes beyond um, issues of race and to sexual orientation, uh, gender, I mean, you name it, socioeconomic status, obviously being a big thing for us here in Vermont. So um, we do have that, that group already. Um, we are waiting for the ACLU and Human Rights Commission to um, have their designees present. They were invited uh, back in January and are working on assigning that to one of their staff members. But uh, the rest of us have been have been meeting and, and working on that uh, project for a while now. So I wanted folks to know that. And also wanted folks to know that um, I was I've been here at the police academy for 18 years. Uh, but in my past life was a mental health crisis clinician, I have a master's degree in psychology. So I was sort of a non traditional uh, pick for the position that I'm in as a director of training and just want you to know that I'm an instructor on crisis response uh, for law enforcement have been for a long time and these issues are very important to me so um, I hear the concerns about these issues of, of fair and impartial policing uh, you know loud and clear they're very important to me and i 100% believe in the philosophy of collaboration. Um, that's what we did when we developed the mental health training that we have. And we brought everybody to the table, st stakeholders from all different sorts of perspectives um, to, to work with us. And you know we're all about that down here. So you'll see no resistance from us on that. Hal Colston has a question for you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Cindy, for testifying. Uh, about a month ago, we hosted, uh, the legislature hosted uh, several um, public hearings uh, that invited people from around the state, Vermonters, to, um, to hear their thoughts. And for me, one of, the, one of the, the striking themes was the lack of trust that Vermonters now have with law enforcement. Um, and I wonder, how do you address that in, in your training? What's your strategy for trying to in, impart the importance of building trust with, mm -hmm. with the citizens of Vermont? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can speak to that, certainly. We have a uh, program that um, I think it's, it's for recruits primarily, but I think we've, we're in discussions with the group that I mentioned and how we also bring that more into leadership and supervisory training. But as an example, um, I spent a whole day with uh, Major Justin Stedman of Fish and Wildlife uh, talking with a new recruit class of this concept of guardianship and um, just a foundation of what it is to be a law enforcement officer in the state of Vermont. Um, that we believe very much in a guardian mentality, that we're caretakers of the community. Even when people misbehave, we're still, you know, to be their caretaker mm -hmm. and, um, and getting them pointed in the right direction and that we're looking to modify behavior, not punish people. 
Uh, we spent a long time talking about the need to take care of oneself and be uh, physically and mentally fit so that you can do your best work for your community. And um, we talk about the concepts of procedural justice and how even sometimes when people do uh, receive a punishment, so to speak, if they receive a ticket, for example, um, if they feel listened to and they feel heard and that they were treated with respect, uh, even though they might have to pay a fine, they still feel better about uh, their relationship with law enforcement versus, um, you know, maybe you let them go, maybe you don't give a ticket, but you don't treat them well, you don't listen and you're not respectful uh, that even though they don't have to pay that fine, they don't feel good about the interaction. So we spent some time talking about research related to that and practice related to that and the concept of, you know, police legitimacy that, you know, every law enforcement agency had in the state of Vermont um, you know, they have so much work to do. They don't get all the, the face time with the community that the officers on the road do. And these new recruits are going to be doing in, in a short number of months. And how important it is that they really spend a lot of time focusing on how to get that concept of police legitimacy, um, you know, as part of their everyday work. So, you know, stopping in maybe at your local convenience store and just, you know, chatting with people, say hello, be available. Uh, we talk about the concept of, you know, contact theory. If there are people in your community that, um, you know, are sort of outside your, your norm population, so to speak, now what are you doing to get out there and, and meet them where they are and hear what their concerns are and just to start to build a relationship. So um, really emphasizing those concepts where, you know, if something goes bad in your department, you need that, um, that trust in the bank with your community to survive it. And so, um, like I said, we spend a whole day uh, with new recruit classes talking about that and we'll you know, continue to try to spread that same information out into our supervisory and leadership programs. We've done a little bit with in-service on that as well, uh, but certainly have a long way to go. So if I could just follow up, um, how do you know that that training is effective? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I wish that I had uh, a better tool to answer that question for you than I have right now. Um, we're hopeful. And I think, um, you know, some of the red flags that we might see to tell us if it's not working is you know, the issues around professional regulation. You know, what are we seeing going on in our communities? Um, I feel pretty good about what's going on in Vermont compared to other places. But as far as having, you know, data on the effectiveness, um, it's something that would require, you know, somebody to work on that, to collect that kind of information, develop tools for that. And we don't have that ability here right now. Thank you. Anyone else have questions for Cindy Taylor Patch? All right, Cindy, any other sections of the bill that you want to flag for us? I think, you know, I just agree with the, you know, commissioner's concern that we need a little time for our new executive director to get started so that we can get uh, rolling on some of the topics that are, you know, you've highlighted as being important. Um, you know, we have a lot of work done. We just need to be able to get that person up to speed uh, so we can get that further down the road. And um, like I said, I'm happy at any time to answer questions about basic training or in-service. Uh, our biggest concern with uh, what seems to be a feeling of offering uh, basic training offsite uh, would be, um, you know, what that location might be. Uh, you know, right now we only, we can use different locations for, you know, a day or a few days at a time, but the volume of training that would be required, you know, our questions would be, what's the space that we're gonna use and who's gonna staff it? Because if I have to send staff offsite to multiple locations and, send instructors, um, basically duplicating um, the number of instructors we would need right now, that would be an enormous uh, burden. So uh, we just want to be clear about the need for um, a significant amount of increase in resources if uh, we were directed to have to do that. Great. Committee, any other questions for Cindy Taylor Patch? Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, we will certainly be in touch if we need to get you on um, on our agenda again as we close out this bill. Thank you. Great. 
Uh, so committee, any uh, any lingering questions that you have for Chief Brickell? All right, I don't see anybody diving to their little blue hands. So uh, thank you so much to Cindy and uh, and Chris for being with us this morning. We we definitely appreciate you sharing your perspective and expertise with us. Um, we have uh, uh, a few minutes left, I guess almost 30 minutes left of our allotted committee time today. And since we have, um, since we have a, a bit of a gap in our agenda, um, I had reached out to the speaker to ask if it would be okay if we moved the two charters that were um, passed back in March um, that are fairly vanilla and non-controversial, um, ones that we uh, have have been over uh, at least with legislative council in some meetings in order to understand um, that they are pretty run of the mill and um, and standard uh, so that we can review them and I think fold them into one bill and send them on their way. So uh, in advance of that, I asked, um, let's see, Bob Hooper and Warren Kitzmiller, I think, are the two committee members I asked to be um, to be in charge of making sure these are pretty standard. Um, and so we've asked Tucker to join us this morning. And Tucker, boy, I tell you, it has been a long time since we saw you. So thanks for being with us today. And um, please take us through H952. All right, hello, and for the record, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council. Uh, I'm going to share the bill for you here so I can give you a uh, quick recap of some of the provisions that you have covered before. Uh, this is presented as a strike all amendment to H952, uh, the City of Burlington Charter Amendments. Uh, we'll start with uh, Burlington's amendments and an overview of what is contained here. Uh, the first three sections that we will go over are amendments uh, to uh, ballot nomination deadlines. Section three is being amended uh, to require that uh, prior to being, it, petitions for nomination for special elections must be filed uh, nine weeks in advance. Um, so you'll see here at the end of the section, starting on uh, line four, uh, that we are setting aside general law and that the petitions shall be filed with the clerk uh, in accordance with the charter, not later than 5 p.m. on the ninth Monday preceding the day of the election. Uh, if you go to 17 VSA section 2681 subdivision A1A, you'll see that under general law, that is a six week requirement. So this bumps it from six weeks to nine weeks for uh, the nominations of municipal officers by special election. Section six, uh, similar idea, uh, establishing specific deadlines um, for uh, special elections. Here, um, the petition has to be filed with a CAO not later than 60 days prior to the election. And I'll note ahead of time that many of the sections that we're gonna go through do with uh, deadlines in general law the loan exception being that uh, first section around the nine week petition filing deadline. Section 22 is uh, similarly amended. We covered this last time as well. Um, for special elections, uh, the CAO has to prepare all official ballots at least 45 days prior to the election. Um, I did hear from our subject matter expert in the area of elections who informed me that this does align with general law, but that in general, uh, most of the ballots are actually prepared 46 days in advance. Uh, 45 days is established, I believe, by uh, federal law requirements. Vermont does it a day ahead of time, and there is some thought that statute should be generally amended to reflect that to 46 days. 
Burlington is putting 45 here. And from what I understand, that's totally fine. Uh, finally, they're adding a new section to their charter to authorize uh, a tax on the grand list and appropriate um, establishment of a fund, the housing trust fund. Apparently it's already established in the city code. What we're dealing with here is the authorization for a, uh, a levied tax on the grand list and then an appropriation to that fund based on that tax. And that is all for Burlington. Great. Should I move on to Barry? Uh, let's see if anyone's diving for their little blue hand. I don't see any hands coming up. Um, go ahead and jog through Barry and we'll come back to questions if we need to. The uh, Barry City Charter amendments are in two categories. They're very quick. Uh, the first is a uh, general amendment of the section of the charter that deals with um, business and contracts between the city and city officials. Um, the amendment strikes uh, the previous language that uh, prohibited any contract between the city and a city official or employee in excess of $500. So it strikes that in excess of $500 uh, line and instead ties the prohibition on uh, business and contracts between officials, employees and the city uh, to their procurement policy or the conflict of interest policy that is adopted by the city council. Uh, the second group here is a set of repeals. Um, first, they are repealing their charter provision related to the uh, office of grand juror. So uh, the grand juror provisions were repealed from general law and uh, well, we'll say removed from general law uh, two or three sessions ago. So this will bring Barry City in line with general law concerning the former office of grand juror. Uh, and finally, they are repealing their uh, article of the charter, which had two or three sections um, that dealt with their specific charter provisions around uh, their housing board of review and security deposits uh, to kind of very quickly cover what happens when you repeal a charter provision. Their specific charter provisions around this housing board of review and security deposits will go away. So they will no longer be controlled by those specific provisions, but the general law around housing boards of review and security deposits will now control uh, conduct of rental housing business within Barry City to the extent that it applies. And that is all. Excellent. Committee members, any questions? Tucker, you have done such a thorough job of explaining it that. Um, Nobody even has a question. <laughs> All right. Um, I would entertain um, a motion, but um, before we do that, we need to designate who is going to be our clerk of the day since uh, as you all remember, Marsha is uh, busy helping her mom through some uh, some uh, medical stuff this week. So who would like to be, who would like to, to record the vote on this? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> all right, Mike, Mike, are you volunteering to be the clerk of the day? Uh, uh Right, I was just scratching my nose, but I will volunteer to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just let me get a. We'll we'll give you a moment to uh, to get a piece of paper out and record the motion um, that I hope we will receive momentarily to vote out H nine fifty two favorably. I so move. All right, any committee discussion? Questions about 
either of the Burlington or Barry City Charter proposals. All right, Mike, let us know when you're ready. All right. Um, Representative Gannon. One, two, three, test. Yes. Testing. Representative Gannon votes yes. Um, Copeland Hanses. Yes. Marwicki votes yes. LeClaire. Yes. Harrison. Yes. Uh, Representative Brownell. Yes. Um, Representative Colston. Yes. Um, Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Kitzmiller. Yes. And Representative Pulasic. Yes. Okay, so we, we have a vote of 10 1, 10 0 1. Excellent. Thank you for that good work, Mike. You you stepped in and, and did an admirable job of shuffling the <laughs> did you go by Zoom tile as you were reading people's <laughs> names? <laughs> no, I'm on the committee website. Okay. <laughs> Great. Or the web page. Mm-hmm. Super. Um, Andrea, we'll send you a record of action that you can you. Uh, fill out to be able to um, uh, be able to make this official. And um, so we have uh, we have two folks who are kind of teaming up to report this. And so you guys need to shoot rock, paper, scissors and decide which one of you is the lead to uh, to deliver the uh, the notice to the clerk's office that we have voted this out. And I assume there's nothing here that would trigger it to go to any other committee. It's going to come to the floor. Is that correct, Tucker? There's no fee or assessment that would trigger it to go to Ways and Means? So I am not certain as to whether it will trigger an automatic send to uh, House Ways and Means, but the Burlington Charter does have that authority for the uh, Housing Authority Trust Fund tax on the grand list. So that may, you know, trigger a movement, but I am not certain. Uh, that sounds great. So uh, Bob Hooper, yep. that's your section of the bill. So be prepared if you, uh, if you get sent to Ways and Means to uh, to present that there. Yep. Any other questions from committee members on uh, on what we're doing here on this? Great. Um, okay, so I, I hope you all got my um, my happy little email yesterday reminding you that that uh, we are in the the last. Uh, the last leg, the home stretch of this, um, I was going to say marathon, but it really actually is a triathlon because I feel like we've been, we've been meeting forever in this 2020 legislative session and we've been doing this in a variety of uh, different formats and ways. Um, and as we bring uh, our final bill of the year to a close, I just want to make sure that in building the agenda for next week that anyone who feels like they've got um, perspectives they need to hear um, has let me know that. So I don't, have, uh, I don't have the agenda finalized for next week, but if you're counting legislative days, um, you will know that we need to have 124 out of our committee um, next week and uh and so that will be my aim and that's what i'm driving towards um uh so let's open this up to committee discussion for oh uh warren has a question go ahead warren mostly i just wanted to see if if andrea could get in touch with the two barry reps peter anthony and tommy waltz as as well as carol dawes barry city clerk uh, I would think that all three of them might want to just offer some brief testimony on, on this proposal. If we can squeeze them in for some time next week. On which, on which proposal? 
952, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, so we, uh, we have already voted that out. Oh. That's what we just did. Okay. I mean, I, I think the committee will recall that we did hear from Carol Dawes um, back at the beginning. I want to say we even heard from her in person before we stopped meeting. Um, but she had she had been of the mind that we that that it wasn't um, it wasn't critically important to to do that charter change before. Uh, before we took care of other COVID and budget related issues, which is why we find ourselves in September, uh, finally getting back to the uh, yeah. to the Barry City Charter. So uh, the right. Barry City members were uh, reps are very happy to know that uh, that we were going to try to squeeze this in, and so um, that's part of the reason why the speaker gave us permission to do yet another bill. I think uh, yeah. I think this committee will do more bills during the September session than, um, than the other committees combined. I don't know, very close <laughs> to it. <laughs> I do recall Carol and I think Peter Anthony testifying, Madam Chair, prior to COVID. So I, yeah. I yeah. recall that. That's right, that's back in the dawn of time. I'd forgotten about all that. I know, yeah. we've been through a lot since then. It's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Long year. Um, so open to committee discussion of, uh, or actually any other questions or well, comments? All you, all you people with really good memories, when did we take this testimony? Uh, sometime after, well, maybe Tucker knows. March. So Carol uh, was with us actually on a few occasions and briefly touched upon the charter provisions. The first time was actually at the very beginning of the session. The committee had taken up a charter cleanup bill. You may recall the 200 some odd pages that was involved in that. But Carol had come in to talk about wanting to have a gender neutral charter. And she brought up the upcoming charter vote at that time. And I would assume that she came back sometime in between then and town meeting day to discuss it again. And then it was uh, maybe mid to late March. I can't remember if it was a phone call or otherwise that she contacted the committee about staying action um, because it wasn't crucial. I don't have any exact dates for you, but if that jogs anyone's memory on how it played out. March 11th. That would be my guess. Yep, why not? <laughs> so I was looking more towards the more northern climbs, but uh, I can talk to you outside this environment. Thank you. All right, a committee discussion back to S124. Um, as I build the agenda for next week, are there any um, specific individuals you would like to hear from again, who who maybe we had in, but you'd like to get more from? Are there general categories of perspectives that you feel we haven't covered yet that you would like to have us seek testimony on? Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you, um, Sarah. Uh, I don't know if it's necessary or not, but um, Representative Shaw from Pittsburgh um, had offered to testify. Obviously, he has concerns about uh, discussion of moving the police academy, uh, given that um, their committee has made some investments in it. Um, so uh, he is certainly available if we want to continue to uh, leave the study of options in there. Um, Obviously, um, those of us in the area might argue that if we've made investments and there's no going to be perfect central location, um, the idea is to go more towards finding um, options to train in other locations, but not necess and not necessarily make the trip when you don't have to. And I do think the Academy and Criminal Training uh, Justice Council is trying to do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mike Merwicki. Um, 
I don't have a specific but a more general comment to make here. And it's that I hope we can emphasize within this bill that this is part of a much larger process we're involved in, uh, even, even larger and longer than this session. And that uh, we're already looking ahead to next session on how we can continue to build on this work. And that we're going to be scaffolding building on each piece of work to go to the next. And this is one part of that. Yes, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, you, you are correct that this is not a one and done. Other questions, Rob LeClaire, suggestions? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The first thing I want to say is I, I am very appreciative of the um, the variety and diversity of the testimony we received around this. Um, I, I think you and others have done a very good job of trying to get as many different perspectives in on this as, as, as you can. So a question I have is um, just going forward here, are, are we looking to address everything in this legislation? I mean, like say dispatch or is the intent to sort of narrow this to some of the areas that there's, well, more agreement than not? I'm just curious to know what yours and others intentions are here. Cause I mean, there's some really heavy lifting left out there to be done and um, recognizing that there are some things that we want to get done, but what are we looking to get done? Well, specifically with respect to dispatch, um, I think uh, that is that is a section of the bill that's crying for um, an adjustment, um, not necessarily being extracted from the bill, but, uh, but being adjusted. Uh, you know, it's clear that we've, uh, that there's a lot, uh, there's a lot more complicating factors out there um, with respect to dispatch. And, um, and I think we, we wanna make sure that we're setting up a scenario where a proposal comes back to the legislature for our, uh, for our vetting and approval. Um, okay. That would be my assessment of what we've heard from who have testified. Mm -hmm. And okay. with respect to the other parts of the bill, um, you, you know, I, I haven't heard anybody saying we need to ditch, you know, A, B, or C section of the bill. Uh, if there are sections of the bill that you feel you need to hear more perspectives on, that's uh, that's really the purpose of, uh, of having yeah. this discussion. No, yeah, no, I think we've done, I mean, I'm just like sitting, thinking about like these citizens advisory boards. Um, I think actually uh, the representative from Winooski had, I think made a comment about maybe having some boards, but at a, at a higher level, like a county level or something along that lines. And it, it does sound like that we certainly need to have more committee discussion, but I think we've got enough specifics that we could maybe start heading in a direction, I guess, but thank you. Jim Harrison. So I'm looking at the summary and not the bill, but I know in 219, we made a criminal offense on, um, yeah, I don't remember if it was relation to the unauthorized use of force like a chokehold. Um, and we put sunsets, we delayed implementation dates and we put sunset because we wanted to revisit it. Is that something we're revisiting it or is judiciary as part of 119 revisiting? Um, that is a great question. And um, I'm gonna ask either Betsy Ann or John to remind me if they have a sense of whether that's um, is something that the judiciary committee is working on because I lost track of that. Anybody remember? I, I do not know if they're working on it or not, but um, Jim, Jim is correct that there are sunsets in 219. Um, 
All right, Betsy Ann. Yeah, so there's still 119 that's uh, on use of force. And I think that's now in house judiciary. And that would seem related to, um, I'm looking at your S219 as enacted and that uh, making it a crime uh, for law enforcement to use uh, prohibited restraint that is set to sunset on July 1, 2021. And the uh, justifiable homicide is also scheduled for repeal on July 1, 21. Those are normally things uh, that would be judiciary related in the, uh, on, for normal committee um, jurisdictions. Of course, it's up to you on whatever you want to, however you would want to handle it. Yeah, I will loop back with um, with the chair of House Judiciary and make sure that this is um, this is something that they are focused on. And if not, I will report back to you, and we will decide what we want to do with that. Thanks. All right. Any other? Questions on various sections of 124, places where you'd like to hear other perspectives. Great. Betsy Ann. Hello, I just wanted to um, bring something up when you're done with the S124 conversation. You got it. Okay. Um, last call on 124 before we shift gears with the last 30 seconds or a minute we have. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Betsy Ann. Just wanted to give you a heads up that Senate GovOps uh, voted out yesterday a committee bill that contains lessons learned uh, based on some of the provisions of law that were enacted specifically to address, uh, address the COVID emergency situation. And so just, and Tucker being here reminded me to remind or to give you that update. Um, it is, I don't know if it's gonna be taken up today in the Senate or might wait until next week. Um, it, it will just get introduced today. Um, so it is, it would put into permanent statutory law provisions that could be used in future states of emergency. So just wanted to put that on your radar um, for if you will want to consider that before adjournment. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay, so um, and who drafted that bill? Tucker and I both. It was a joint effort because it deals with open meetings, municipalities, elections, professional regulation, and uh, sheriff emergency funding. All right. Well, we will keep an eye on any gaps in our schedule next week to have uh, have the one-two punch of um, of our two favorite uh, ledge council folks in, in these areas to give us a run through on what the Senate is sending us. All right, uh, that is time. And does anybody in the committee have any lingering questions? All right, well, we have a little bit of time before we go to house floor and may it not be quite as long as it was yesterday. Um, and uh, so great work this week committee. We have covered a lot of ground. We've heard from a lot of, uh, a lot of different perspectives and, and I really appreciate your attention and focus on this really important issue. So uh, great job this week and see you on the floor later today.